Ray Flores joined alongside by Bellator CEO Bjorn Rabney following the conclusion of Bellator 60 here at the venue at Horseshoe Casino here in Hammond, Indiana on MTV2. Bjorn, what an event from top to bottom in the main event. Pat Curran gets a TKO win over Joe Warren to become the new Bellator featherweight championship. Let's talk about the ascension of Pat Petty, my Curran. My goodness, has he come a long way. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it's everything that we wrote the book on Bellator for. It's a guy who was kind of mired in obscurity in terms of his fight career and he had Brian Butler and, and Jeff Curran came to us and said please give him an opportunity please give him an opportunity and we did in a lightweight tournament that actually Mike Corey bounced out of because of an injury and God he has just been on a roll ever since I mean he's just from the very first knockout of Mike Ricci who was supposed to be the next GSP out of out of Canada and then the win over Huerta and the win over Amada and the toe-to-toe -to -toe with Eddie Alvarez for the lightweight title the drop to 45 and he has looked unbeatable so it's just it's a great story he's made hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting with this organization He's now our world champion. He's a Chicagoland kid and a great human being. It's just it's a very positive story. I could not be happier for Pat Curran. What a story it has been, but actually during the fight, it was back and forth action, and then Pat had a Warren against the cage. Do you feel that the fight was stopped too late, in your opinion? Yeah, you know, you, you, you always want to give as much as much kind of flexibility and discretion to your opinions on something like that as you can, but boy, looking at it Cade side and then having a chance to watch the replay a couple of times, I think it should have been stopped earlier. I think, you know, the, look, there's, there's that fine balance. It's a world title fight, and the guy's got everything on the line, and this is what he's worked for. So when do you step in and take that away from him? When do you step in and take that opportunity away versus your job to protect him, and when do you step in to do that? And it's a judgment call, and you've got to make that call in a split second. I, I would have liked to have seen them stop the fight earlier. But Wouldn't you rather have a fight, though, stopped earlier than later in terms of how it can affect somebody from a physical standpoint? You know, given those two choices, yes. But the optimal choice, the one that I would really like to see, is, is, is very, very highly trained expert officials who 99.9% .9 of the time are able to make the right call. And they don't stop it too early, and they don't stop it too late. And they know what they're looking at, and they're in perfect position to see the blows, and they can make that call based on experience and education. That's what I would love to see. We're not there yet, obviously. Were you a little upset by the late finish or on the late stoppage? Yeah, I was upset. I was upset by the fact that I'm Joe Warren's a friend of mine, and I'll, you know I, I count myself as pretty lucky. A lot of these guys who step into the cage are friends of mine, and Joe and I have got a great relationship. And you see a guy getting hit, and you, you see his hands down around his side, and you see him leaning up against the cage, and you see n n no stability in his knees, and you say to yourself, God, you know, you just you want you, you you don't want him to get hurt. You know, you don't want him to get punished. And and at that point, I was hoping he was going to stop the fight. We're now looking ahead at, at some of the other fighters that looked impressive tonight. Obviously, Marla Sandro came out and looked outstanding, along with a very impressive performance by Mike Corey. Daniel Strauss also came out and took care of business. Everyone seeming to grow inside the Bellator ranks, and you know, let's discuss some of these featherweight performances this evening. Boy, I mean, I thought Daniel looked. Daniel's always hugely self-critical. He's about the most self-critical fighter I've ever seen. He, I thought he looked very good. I thought he could. You know, Daniel can always do some things better. He is a physical phenom and and you know I think the reality is he's got um, Daniel Strauss has unlimited potential Marlon Sandro I think is one of the best featherweights in the world you know he came and did a vicious knockout loss to Pat Curran last summer um, and he's come back and looked dominant he looked great again tonight uh, Mike Corey looked great you know I mean Popo looked dominant again and was able to didn't rely purely on his jiu-jitsu to win the fight so um, really talented guys I mean just a wicked level of talent in our 45 division you see four moved on and they're all just hugely talented fighters how excited are you for the for the first title defense of Pat Curran? I am incredibly excited about the first title defense of Pat Curran. I mean, Pat Curran's going to fight Patricio Pitbull, and literally, I mean, there's two of the greatest featherweights on the face of the earth. An exciting, wicked knockout power by both of them. I mean, creating the the 30 second ad to run in market for that is going to be like like low hanging fruit. They both just knock guys out and have got unbelievable finishes. I mean, this one and the the Ricci knockout, the Sandro knockout, back to back in terms of Pat Curran and Patricio with the Hayes knockout and what he's done has just been crazy. You know, I mean. They're, they are incredibly, that's a very high level of ground fighting, submission fighting, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, and striking with knees. And I mean, you look at Pat, he's always coming off the ground with flying knees. The elbows are always moving. The hand, it's just, it's technical striking is spectacular. And Patricio's the same way. I mean, that, that's, that's a great fight.
Well, speaking of great fights, there have been a lot of great fights on MTV2 that are right behind me, along with Spike.com. Tell us about the relationship now, working with Spike, and I know that you're moving to Spike in the month of January, nine months away from gaining on Spike television, but MTV still, too, is your home at the moment, but, you know, let's give, give us an idea of the difference and the change in production level when it comes to Bellator. Well, the changes have all been taking place over the last six to nine months. I mean, the guys at Spike have been completely integrated into everything we're doing on MTV2. They're part of the same family. It's MTV Networks, which is owned by Viacom. They're both under the same umbrella. So all of the expertise that Spike has is being shared with everyone at MTV2. And that's where you're seeing the evolution of the show, the evolution of the storytelling, the better graphics packages, the better music, the better camera angles. Everything that's happening to elevate the level of this show is happening because of that Spike team. They know more about television production, reaching our demo, connecting with that demo, programming MMA in a way that MMA fans love than anybody in the history of the world. They do it better than anybody, and they're, they're providing that expertise to this company, which is just a gift. You mentioned a reality show during your post-fight comments. Can you expound? on that not really <laughs> <laughs> yeah give us even a little bit of us of something of what is on the cards or what's potentially on the table you know we're just we're, we're conceptualizing now and we're working with some of the smartest people in the business in terms of how a reality show could look underneath the Bellator banner and what it would be about and how it would function but is it we're filter into the tournament format if at all possible you know obviously what you want to do is you want to use a reality show like that as Spike did so successfully for five years to build up fighters who can ultimately transition into fighting at a world-class level for you like the Pat Kearns and and uh, many of the other guys that you saw tonight so you know that's kind of the, the vision for it but we really don't have an idea conceptualized yet. You talked about Joe Warren dropping down in 135 you know he's suffered two back-to-back -back knockout losses you know everyone it's a difference after you get knocked out for the first time how you come back many guys are not the same fighter with this being two for Joe Warren do you feel he's gonna come back as the same fighter? I don't know. I, I have an amazing amount of trust in Joe's ability to gauge where he is as a fighter and as an athlete. He's a world-class athlete. He's a Greco-Roman world champion. I mean, this guy has achieved the highest level of success in athletics, and particularly in combat athletics. So, um, you know, well, Joe's as bright as they come. We'll sit down, we'll talk to Joe, we'll figure it out, and we'll see where his head is and what he really is looking, looking to do next. Well, you go from 135 to the heavyweight division along with having the women's. Any idea of potentially introducing the flyweights? haven't given a lot of thought to 125 as of yet. Really what we're focused on right now is building out enough repetition in the tournament so that we can do away with the super fight. So every time a guy like a Pat Curran or a Mike Chandler or a Ben Askren steps into the cage, they're defending the world title. So that's my first and foremost concern. There's some talented 125ers out there, but right now I want to get us to a point where every single time a belt holder is stepping into the cage, that belt's on the line. Maybe potentially 2012 or 2013? Conceptually, conceptually, depends on how quick we can get that mechanism going so that guys like Pat and some of those other title holders I talked about are defending every time they step in. Finally, BR, look ahead towards the coming future. Will you guys be back here in Hammond, Indiana at the Horseshoe Casino and also look ahead towards what the fans can look forward to in the next couple of weeks of Bellator Fighting Championships? After Bellator 60, boy, this one's going to be a hard act to follow. Well, th I, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, we will absolutely be back at, at Horseshoe Hammond. This place was spectacular. Packed house, gorgeous venue, and the people were just spectacular to work with. They, they understand the space backward and forward. Next week, Santos versus Prindle, unfinished business in the heavyweight division, $100,000 check on the line, and, and the tournament championship at heavyweight. Um, the beginning of our middleweight tournament, which is just ridiculously stacked top to bottom. Our middleweight division has increased in terms of its quality, much like 35 did in our last tournament. It's just gotten just full to the brim. Um, the week after that, the lightweights take off in Laredo, Texas, and Patricky Pitbull comes back with a vengeance. And then the week after that, the the welters it just it just keeps rocking and rolling and then we got on literally when these guys step in in the semis of this 145 pound tournament you got Ben Askren fighting Doug Lima for the world title defending his title against Lima who's a, just one of the most dangerous punchers in the division so it just keeps coming so much on the table looking forward to it. Bjorn thanks so much we'll see you in the coming future thanks I appreciate it Bellator CEO Bjorn Rabney joining us after Bellator 60